Hi everybody, this is Tracy. Today I'm going to talk to you about a covert love affair. Because when we think about covert narcissists, or overt for that matter, we think of the end, right? We think of the way it ended. And we forget that there was love in the beginning. And today I want to talk to you about my covert love affair. When did I meet my second husband? We met at, at Priceline when we worked together. We met through friends and um, I'd been working there for many years and he had been transferred in from another division. So I knew his friends before I knew him. And um, it was a very vulnerable time in my life. I had actually already made the decision to um, divorced my first husband and I was in the middle of going through that divorce when I met we'll, we'll call him 2x again I don't want to say his name um, he who shall not be named um, it was a very vulnerable time in my life because I had made the decision to get a divorce from my first husband my child's father and um, while I had a great job and I knew that Showing my son what real love was was more important to me than staying together because I thought if, if we had to stay together, he would, um, my son would think that this is how love really was. And unfortunately, that's not really the case. And so I decided I would, I would take that plunge and I made that decision. And it was not an easy decision to come to. Divorce usually isn't, but it was my choice. So I met 2X and um, I was attracted to him because of his kind heart. He was a very loving, very generous, very giving person and that attracted to me. Um, he had a snack center in his office if you would. So um, he fed snacks to all of the IT people. And I actually had a candy bowl on my desk and I had always um, fed snacks to the people on, on my IT floor. So um, it was like similar, it was weird. I was like, how could two people be so alike? Here we are both giving of ourselves and, um, and my friends were friends with him, so it made it safer. Does that make sense? Because I, I had a built-in sort of automatic trust level because they were, um, they were his friends and they knew of him before I did. So when we first started dating, we weren't really dating at first, we were friends. And um, the reason that we became friends was, was part of the divorce. I was um, ordered by the judge to be out of our marital home two days a week, and my ex-husband was ordered to be out of the house two days a week, which meant that suddenly I had to find somewhere to be after work on those two days. And while I um, jumped couches, stayed with friends, stayed with family, um, it, it was getting old, and the divorce was taking a toll on me. And um, because I worked for Priceline.com at the time, I was able to get some pretty good deals and start to stay at hotels. But then I had this gap. Work ended at, say, 6, and I didn't know what to do. So my friends, including my soon-to-be husband um, and, and his friends, all would take me out. We'd all go somewhere. We'd have dinner. Um, and we built a friendship. And everything I could see about this person was genuine and real. And um, everybody loved him. He was the man about town. He was the positive, go get him. Um, he was 10 years younger than me at the time. Well, he's still 10 years younger than me. Um, and he had never lived, in a, lived away from home, which was should have been a red flag. But um, he was 35 at the time, maybe. And so... Um, when we were out with friends, again, I loved the fact that he had so many friends. 
Um, they were all from work at that point and they were all really close. This is something that I, I saw as a lack in my first husband, my son's father, was he didn't have any friends. And everything that we did was something that I would almost control because well, our friends are doing this or we're going off to a soccer game here. Um, and suddenly I had someone that had their own tribe, that had someone, other people that trusted them and they were independent in that way. One of the things that stands out in the very beginning was this day we took off. We snuck away and took off this day and went to, in Connecticut, this wonderful waterfalls called Kent Falls. And we hiked and we had a picnic and we cuddled and something that was another thing that, that attracted me to him was his sense of honor. He was so honorable that he wouldn't have sex with me for about six months until I was officially divorced. And I thought that was a good thing. I didn't know that I would never see that honorable person again. And that's part of the, the reason I, I, I got confused. When the covert exclaimed something like that, so they, they've said, I am honorable, I am not going to sleep with you until you are a free woman. Um, when they give you that message, then I took that as honorable, right? But as time would go on, I also looked at other things that attracted me to it. And other things like his family. His family was a story at first, a story of how close they were, a story of how they would do anything for each other, a story of a family that traveled and vacationed together every year and um, the adventures were plastered on the walls of his office with pictures of the Galapagos and Italy and things like that done with his family. And that was a hole in my world, a hole in my life that, that I wanted filled. I liked the idea of family and I certainly liked someone that was so close to their family. And so that was an attractive feature about him, if you would. And um, his family took me in um, at first, we, we didn't introduce him to my son for a long time, but um, they took me in on that first Easter when I was alone, and they gave me family. They immediately um, showered me with love, showered me with things, if you would, um, showered me with the promise of a family. My mother-in-law called me daughter right away. My step my sister-in-law um, called me her sister, and we were pretty darn close, even closer than I'd ever been with my sisters. So I was finding my family. This was a, an attraction to him that um, I think we all have. There's something about a covert narcissist that um, this this act, this role that they're playing of, of Good Samaritan, this, this loving person, is something we want to believe. So as I went through my divorce, he was always there for me. Again, something we need, um, something we're looking for, a hole in us. I wasn't looking for a relationship. I was not even done with the first one. And, uh, and that shame of getting a divorce and changing my life was an impetus to engage more with this person because I was seeing something in him that I, I wanted to have in my life. The things that a covert narcissist does are um, very hidden. You don't see, they're very subtle. You don't see the abuse. You don't see unless you've got a special kind of narc glasses, which I think I should design. You know, narc glasses, then we can see maybe they're, you know, one was rose colored and one is like black. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I forgot what I was saying. Um, the other thing was that they, him and his family, pretty much instantly turned to my son. And when they did meet him, he became the grandson. This is before we were married, before we were engaged, before all of the romance had been happening. 
they were taking my son under their wings. And to me, that was the answer to my prayers. I got him a family. I found him something. The things that he was doing to X, my husband, was, was showing up at soccer games, coming to baseball games. And that touched my heart. With all of his gang of friends, we started going to, we bought season tickets to a local baseball team. And um, we'd go every single week. And my son would come and he would sit on 2X's lap. What a, a sense of joy to um, have someone love your child. Wow, that's what I wished his father would, would have done. That, that is what I wished for my son to have, was to have a family and to have that father that sits you down at the baseball game on your knee and, and, and loves on you. But as I look back at it now, I can see much more clearly, and I'm sure you can too, if you look through and, and think about the things that um, you might not have seen, just like me. In a way that was so covert, um, when we would go to those baseball games and we'd be there with the 10 friends, my son was on his lap, was on 2X's lap and maybe it was time to leave. And all the buddies, all the friends, all the guys would pick up my son and carry them on his shoulder. But then they started dunking him in the garbage can. They would, like, he'd be screaming and I'd be screaming to stop that. But they would do it. And it was all in fun. So it was sort of hidden. I didn't think of that as abuse. But it was the beginning of the abuse of my son. It was the beginning of devaluing him, if you would. Here he was, you know, the, the child making a snowman the week before with this man, and, and now um, it, it almost appears as if he got jealous because he had to suddenly share me. Remember, the first six months or so, he never met my son, and he had me all to himself. Now suddenly he has to um, be a daddy and... He was taking that role on. He was the super dad. But then the jealousy started to come in. And it was so subtle that I didn't see it at first. The jealousy of, of a child. He would tell me something that my mother used to tell me all the time, that I loved my son too much. That I was too close to him because we read books before bed. Or I helped him with his homework because I was a Boy Scout leader, because I did all of the things I did as a mother. I was loving him too much. So pampering him, babying him, he would say. And his attitude changed toward him. While the days of making snowman um, kind of faded away, the days of him trying to change the way I parented started to begin. When he would do something that was not nice and I would speak up, the way he compensated was with stop. My son had a $2,000 Halloween party um, because he had done something that wasn't very nice. And suddenly the reward was, but look how much we love you. Look what I'm willing to do. I didn't see that as what it was, buying his love, buying my love, really, um, because it, it was like an apology to me for being shitty um, or telling me I wasn't a good parent. It all kind of like worked out. Does that make sense? He um, started to chip away at what was real. If I ever spoke up, he used passive aggressive um, kind of behaviors and I didn't really know what those were. I didn't know that the silent treatment um, of just closing your arms and just, I'll, I'll be over here. I'm gonna go work downstairs. You know, you do what you gotta do. I'm gonna do it over here. All because I just spoke up. The relationship with his family, again, 
the love bombing, the um, idealization that um, I was the best thing that had ever happened to him. That if he ever decided to leave me that they would kill him because I was such a good catch. And um, I did make him mature. I, I think I helped him a, a lot because he was very, very much um, stifled by his parents living in their home. And I started to see that, that fairy tale, that mask of the perfect family starting to be whittled down. And I, again, I didn't know what it meant. I just knew I was confused. I think that's something we have to understand when we talk about covert narcissists is sometimes the behavior is so covert that we can't identify it. We just get confused. Wait, that wasn't two plus two. That doesn't add up. If they were this wonderful, loving, supportive family, why did they fight and scream and kick and bite and like the whole nine yards? These people were evil to each other. And especially the sister, especially his older sister, um, uh, they just treated her like some sort of animal. <laughs> and, um, and she would, she suffered with major depression. She suffered with anxiety and, and she would also go into her room, curl up into a little ball and um, not want to face anything. Why were his family members fighting at a five-star restaurant? And why did his grandfather hit the sister across the face in the middle of said five-star restaurant? None of it made sense. And I didn't understand that it was abuse. I just thought they would tell me, well, this is how our family is. And, and that I, who had a dysfunctional family, I, I didn't know what a real family was. So while they were strong together, they also fought like cats and dogs, and that's what a family does. I don't know that I really agreed with that, but I learned, right? In the beginning of their love bombing stage, his family towards me, um, they threw away all my clothes, and um, they dressed me like a princess. That was the making of a princess, act one where um, I still regret that one dress. Oh my God, it was my favorite. And um, maybe it wasn't appropriate for their world, but it sure made me happy. And um, when they bought me new clothes, I thought it was what they were saying, the um, making of a princess, right? The, um, the, you belong and deserve to have these beautiful things. It seemed like a reasonable thing. I never once thought that that was control. I never really knew what control was. I mean, I lived with it my whole life, but I didn't see that throwing away my clothes was saying you're not good enough. That what you have and what you're coming into this relationship with is not good enough. That you deserve better, we're gonna give you better because we love you. I didn't see the control part. I remember the first time um, We had dinner, I had dinner at his parents' house. It was my first Easter alone without my son and I was pretty distraught. And the weird thing was that there were probably like 26 people. I think that's how many people their dining room table held. Um, but I was separated. I was separated almost as a test by my would-be <laughs> in-laws. You sit over here, he's sitting over there. They were testing me. Did I test, did I, um, was I able to engage with their guests? Was I able to perform, if you would, to their standards? And um, apparently I passed that test, which is good. Um, but the whole thing was, was very confusing. Um, but I was falling in love with that family. I didn't see the evil for most of the time. I would say that until my husband asked me for a divorce on the telephone, I didn't see all of this abuse. As I have learned about it, I can go back through these confusing moments, these times where I didn't understand things, and um, 
I can see them as abuse now. I remember when my husband asked me for the divorce, he said something that stuck with me for a long time, still to this day. So yeah, six years later, he said, come on, you must have known something was wrong. Well, to me, we didn't fight. Me, I equated my parents fighting and, and the, the life that I had grown up with, with dysfunctional. We most of the time got along. What I noticed was that man that I had met in the very beginning when I worked at Priceline, I met this man that planned things. He would, you know, romantically do these things that were just over the top. If the Hope Diamond was coming to New York City, let's go see it. Let's go see this butterfly exhibition. There's a concert here. I'm going to get us tickets. Take me to New York City and show me the city like I had never seen it. I was only an hour away, and until I met him, I didn't really know or love New York. I learned to love it when he would take me places. And as we walked down the streets, I was always on the inside. They would never allow me to be on the outside because that's more dangerous. So he'd stand on the outside and I on the inside as this protective thing. He'd put his arm out and I would hold on to his arm as we walked. Very proper, very mannerful. All of these things were um, something I was missing in my first relationship. Someone to plan things, someone to come up with the ideas, someone to have creative fun and um, I didn't notice, but I can look back at now. All of that went away. He stopped caring. He stopped looking for things to do. And he went back to his recluse world of sitting on a big ass chair with a remote control on his arm. He started to make excuses. But when he did entertain, when we did do something, it was big. It was big and it was um, fun and it was exciting. And so I got to learn and manage down that even though this was how we were in the beginning and it was so much fun, that that's not how real people live. That's not how real life is. After a busy weekend, you need to sit on the couch and watch Lord of the Rings 45 times. Um, and, and that made sense to me. I mean, we couldn't keep up the pace of jet setting and, and having this, this, you know, exciting life. We did need downtime. So I didn't notice the subtle change that he stopped finding things to do, that he stopped doing these things that attracted to me, him to me. Can you look back at your narcissist that, and, and, Dig through these memories and, and analyze what happened. Because I think a lot of people are confused about covert narcissists that they might have been doing it all along. And, and while I can look back now and see that he was doing stuff all along, um, it wasn't bad. It was just things were different. I didn't know I made a video about this the other day about things being different now after a narcissist, but um, it was so subtle. The changes evolved and slowly and slowly and slowly turned him into something that he wasn't at the beginning. When I can look back, really the pinnacle change in him was when he got a job here in Colorado and moved us across the country to um, here in Colorado. And um, now I think his jealousy kicked up. I think his jealousy of me and my son kicked up because he didn't have his, his core buddy friends anymore to do things with. He didn't go out and make new friends here. He never made new friends here. Um, he worked with people and he never really clicked with them because I think his misfit friends back in Connecticut were with him for a long time and I think they were more fans than they were friends. They did things for him because he was generous to them. He would take them out to expensive, expensive, crazy dinners and he was buying them. 
here in Colorado, people weren't quite so superficial. And um, he had difficulties making friends. So that said, when we moved here, I started to see him being jealous that I was, you know, keeping busy, making a new life, making new friends, making us a home. And he started to change the way he was with my son. Even those tender moments that he used to have, sitting on his knee, learning to ride a mower, making a snowman. Now, my son was a teenager and he was a, a really good, smart kid that did what was right. He never caused trouble and, and uh, knock on wood for that. But um, he was a threat to him and I never figured out why. He would be extremely mean and violent to him. And I actually took him to two different therapists while, while he lived here with us because he would get angry at my son for, say, not opening the car door. And he actually ran over his feet. Thank God he had on like weird, heavy shoes that nothing happened. But, um, because he wouldn't let him in the car because I had gotten in the car first. Weird, right? Um, control. It was, if we were walking into Walgreens and there's like two doors, right? We're walking in and I walked first. The door opens, but he was walking and, and my husband would grab his hair, rip him backwards, twist him down to the ground and throw him on the floor in the middle of Walgreens, embarrassing him. And um, I didn't like that. So I would take him to a therapist. And of course he would always insist that he was never going back to that therapist because they um, they didn't believe him. Step parents can parent their children. And, and the therapist said, she's the mother. If she says she doesn't want you hurting her child, stop hurting her child. He didn't. The truest way that I saw the mask fall, if you would, was when we were going through the divorce. For me, that's when I really saw the cruelty. I might have seen these slow erosions of what I originally thought I had. But when the divorce came and the lies and the smears and the threats and the accusations and... Um, just really being mean and, and terrible. I know that he was being run by his mother and his father. They were running the show. But um, that's when I really saw the terrible person that he was. So I want you to look back and see if you can identify these things that you might have missed. Because if you can identify that you might have missed them, you can see this slow erosion. I'm doing this work now, right? We all do and continue this work. I'm not doing it to, to, to blame or accuse or go, oh, yeah, you did that, asshole. I'm doing it for me to go, Tracy, look, when they were throwing your kid in the garbage can, that was humiliating to your son. He might have been 10 and I thought it was funny. I thought it was great because he finally had boys to be boys with. He was being a boy. He was like, I was wrong. That's why I'm doing this. I'm looking back and going, why did you think that was funny? Why did you allow that? Don't let it happen again. So look back through and see if you can identify these things. Because it's in identifying these missing pieces that we can identify the covertness as it slowly disintegrated, right? From, from this high idealization, everything's wonderful point, to the slow devaluation. The slow devaluation for us was him not having my son on his lap and throwing him into a dumpster. Him and, um, you know, changing the way and the rules for what, how, how he was in the beginning. The sensitive, kind, loving person. 
I was in love with something that wasn't real. And while I sit down and I can look back and go, oh my God, my whole life was not real. And it wasn't. But why didn't I see it? That's the question you have to ask yourself. That is the reason that I'm making this video. Because we all started off with that love story. That love story was something that held our hearts. But then we wake up one day and we go, whoa, my life was a lie. We miss shit in the middle. I want you to go and look at that shit. I want you to go look at it, figure it out, analyze it. And for every little nugget that you can pull out and see how it slowly morphed into something and we accepted less. The bar went from up here to here to here, to here, to the ground. Why didn't I see that? Why did I allow that to happen? It's my accountability. My accountability that I'm asking you to go figure out. Not to blame, not to victim blame, but to never let it happen again. If we don't identify the behaviors that we missed, we're gonna miss him again. That's all I got. The love story. What was yours? If you haven't been to my website, please visit Narcissist Abuse Support. There you can sign up for me to do coaching with you. I coach people to help them understand what just happened and how to figure out what to do next. If you're divorcing a narcissist, I got that experience too, but I've also talked to thousands of survivors and I know how to help you. So, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. This is Tracy Malone. Thank you so much for watching and have a great NARC.